So we're wrapping up our, uh, our sermon series on what's in a name, and uh, it was an emotional week for me. Um, not like cry over my bed emotional, but like, I can't believe it, I'm wrapping this up. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm just kind of getting into it, getting into a groove, and it's, uh, it's very special for me, especially going into this time of the year, to kind of really uh, refocus myself on who Jesus is. I don't know if a lot of you are like me, but sometimes you get so caught up in just like the details or like I'm trying, all right, got to make sure I prayed today. Got to make sure I read the Bible today. Got to make sure I did my devotions. Got to make sure, make sure, make sure. And and you forget to just kind of stop and abide. And that's what we're going to really get into today. Um, This has kind of forced me to slow down and be like, okay, if we had nothing else in all of scriptures, but John telling us who Jesus is, It's a beautiful thing. So it's so nice to be able to pause and kind of reflect on that and go through the I am statements. Now, having said that, we're going to cram a whole lot in this morning. (laughs) Um, And I'll try to do the best I can and be respectful of your time. But uh, I want to make sure that we really get a grasp on who this Waymaker is. And now we, we know, based on the last few weeks, that these I am statements that Jesus makes is a direct callback to when God introduced himself to Moses at the burning, not burning bush. And then today, we're going into the last three statements. And today is Palm Sunday. We're going to have a little reflection on that, some of the things that led up uh, to today. And of course, this next week, we celebrate Uh, the death, uh, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And what's really neat is when you go through scriptures, Jesus is not the only one that resurrected from death. Now, he's the only one that did it on his own, and that is significance. But even through the Gospels, there are three recorded instances of people being raised from the dead. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record uh, Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead by Jesus. And, and Luke records another instance where uh, Jesus raised a widow's son. And then today what we're going to kind of look at is Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Now, if you remember last week, we left Jesus off at, with Jesus and his disciples on the other side of the Jordan River. They're in the region where John the Baptist had originally been baptizing people. And we know that things have been heating up in Jerusalem because of Jesus, his confrontations with the Pharisees. And so eventually they had to get out of Dodge for a little bit. They had to get, uh, get some space, let things cool off a little bit. But then chapter 11 opens up with a messenger coming to them, news about a friend of Jesus, Lazarus, who was sick. And Lazarus is a brother of Mary and Martha, and they lived in a small town called Bethany just outside of Jerusalem. Now, these siblings were very close to Jesus. He would stay with them while visiting Jerusalem. And upon hearing the news of his friend's illness, Jesus inexplicably chooses to stay where he was for two more days. John eleven four. 4, Jesus heard it. He said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And if you just read that, we already know what the ending is, right? So we're like, yeah, of course, we, we know what glory is going to happen. But imagine being in the instance Jesus and the disciples, his very close friend, a very close family, Jesus has proven time and time again to be the great healer, the the great resurrector, and and his own friend, someone who's really close to him, is in desperate need of him, and he waits. And in verse 7, this is after two days, two days he waits. Then he says to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. So now he's going to head over in that direction. Now, this isn't just an easy stroll. Remember, like, the tensions are really high right now. So the disciples are thinking, you know what? He's probably already dead. We should probably stay put. And in verse 8, the disciples say, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again. You're going to go back into this. So verse 9 says, look, are not there 12 hours in the day? 
If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Now that's a, a reflection on what the Jewish people at the time kind of had their own um, picture of what day and night were. The Jewish day was from sunrise to sunset, and the night was from sunset to sunrise. So they kind of took their 24-hour period and divided it into two separate 12-hour things. It's kind of what we do uh, ourselves. And one who walks by the day does not stumble because he has what? Light. And the one who walks in the night stumbles because he has no light. So Jesus is referring to his ministry right now as day. Like this, his ministry is day. This is the light that they're going to move on with. And then we have this exchange in verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples, and we're going to get into it. The disciples, they're great. Their ignorance and their lack of understanding is perfect for us. Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. So they miss the deeper meaning of what Jesus was saying here. So then he goes and he tells them quite plainly in verse 14, Lazarus has died. But for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. And then Thomas called the twin in verse 16, let us also go that we may die with him. They literally think they're walking into a situation where they're going to die. They're going to be stoned. They're going to be taken out. Um, it, like, it really isn't clear. Maybe Thomas is talking about dying with Lazarus. Uh, he's afraid that Jesus might be walking into a trap. But if we really look at this, step back and look at this, a lot of times in scriptures, people say things that have meanings that are far beyond what are intended. And though Thomas, though the statement was very gloomy, it might have been more profound and prophetic than he could possibly understand. The disciples needed to experience a death and a resurrection, kind of like what Lazarus did. And so do we. We all need to die to our old life, die to our old ways to be born into a new life. And the work of the Holy Spirit is what wakes us up into this new life. And that's what our life is meant to be all about. When you look at the passage, and we, when you look a lot of times into Jesus and his teachings, and uh, you're going to find that quite frequently there's a lot of uh, double meanings in his words. Uh, for example, there are two types of sleep that Jesus would talk about. Mark 5, 39. When he entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. In verse 40, they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. So Jesus said he's sleeping, but the child was in fact dead. But taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And she rose. So Jesus uses a metaphor, the word of sleep, to describe people who are actually dead. And it's not too far-fetched to think that this might be an interchangeable, indistinguishable thing for him. He knows something that we don't, right? What to us is death, to, to him is more like we're finally waking up from this long sleepwalk that we call our lives. Second, there's two kinds of death that he refers to. Ephesians tells us that we are dead in the trespasses and sins of which we once walked. We're following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, the spirit that is now at work with the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And then one of my favorite phrases in all the Bible, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love of which he loved us, even though we were dead... In our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Revelations 3 says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So there's this kind of almost like living death, like a zombie-like state that, we, that many of us fall into. And 
it's kind of terrifying to, to, to think of the truth about being truly alive. Like, like we're, breath- we're alive, but we're still dead. Like we're alive physically, but we're dead spiritually. Two kinds of death. But there's also two kinds of life that he mentions. John 5, 21, as a father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. And then Jesus' prayer, one of his prayers in the upper room, Jesus spoke in this word, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, life, our life, our physical life here on earth is a precious gift, not to be taken for granted, not to be wasted. But our life after death is not something to be missed out on. The, uh, the author, <laughs> I'm going to mess up his name, and I've worked on it, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the author of maybe a book you've heard of, Crime and Punishment. So he was once arrested by the czar and sentenced to die. But in actuality, the whole thing was just a cruel joke that they set up to try to traumatize those people who were rebelling against the regime. They're blindfolded, they're brought before a firing squad, and they heard the guns go off, but they were blanks. And this whole experience had a profound effect on Dostoevsky. He says he remembers waking up the morning of his execution, knowing that it would be the last day of his life. He said when he ate his last meal, he savored every bite. Every breath he took was breathed with an awareness of how precious it is. He said every face he saw, he studied with intensity. He wanted every experience to be etched into his mind. And as they marched him to the courtyard, he said he felt the warmth of the sun on his back like he never felt it before. Everything around him, he said every blade of grass had a magical quality about it. He said he was seeing the world as if he had never seen it before. And all of his senses were heightened, and that's when he truly felt alive. He says after the experience of this fake execution, his life was never the same. He became grateful to people he'd previously hated. He became thankful for everything in his life, but especially life itself. He had been born again. There's something precious about this life we need to take full advantage of. So let's get back to the story. So Jesus gets into town, and one of the first people he runs into is Martha, Lazarus' sister. And Martha expresses this kind of faith that is actually very similar, very familiar to many of us. She says to Jesus in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you were really God, you would have prevented this physical death. Because that's what you do. Now, Martha and many of the followers of the time, at that, in that time, they treated death as the end of life. It's the final defeat. It's a sign that God had, def- had deserted them, and the presence of death to them felt like the absence of God. And yet, when Jesus comes up, the sight of Jesus doesn't give her any more hope. Her brother was dead. But Jesus assures her, your brother will rise again. He says in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she knew of a future resurrection. She had heard the teachings of Jesus. She knew that the followers and the believers would eventually one day resurrect again. And so she had some hope in that, but you can't help but hear a little bit of snark in her comment. Then comes the statement. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I can see him looking in her eyes. Do you believe this? This is a question I think that Jesus asked us. Do you believe this? 
Do you believe that Jesus came to bring life and life everlasting? Do you believe it with all your heart? And if we take a poll this morning, I would say that most all y'all would raise your hand and say yes, because it's easy to do in this environment. But does your life proclaim your belief in Jesus? Do people at work know your belief in Jesus? Do your neighbors, do your friends, do your family? Remember, Jesus is speaking of two kinds of life, two kinds of death. And next he comes and encounters Mary, the sister, the other sister. And she has the same faith as, her, as Martha. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was, saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then comes a very powerful passage into the heart of Jesus. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. It, we've all been to funerals. Most all of us have probably been to emotional funerals of loss. Think about this, though. Not only in their minds is there a loss of their brother, their friend, but there was also a potential that he did not have to die because they were that close to Jesus, and yet he still died. You can feel this, like, this pain, this lack of belief, and Jesus knows this. And he says to them, where have you laid him? He said, Lord, come and see. And then one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture, the one that most all of us can memorize this morning, most of us, Jesus wept. And we could preach a dozen sermons on this one short verse. Jesus knows our pain, his heart is breaking for our breaking heart. So we got to move on, though. So Jesus now looks at the situation at hand. And he silences, like, there's objection. Like, look, Lazarus has been in there. He's been in there a while. He's dead. And he smells. This is going to be a whole thing, Jesus. And Jesus says, look, in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And next he prays to his father. They take away the stone. Jesus lifts his eyes and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said on this account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. He's saying, look, I know you, you hear me. I know we're in, but I'm doing this so that they can know. And then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I'm telling you, if he didn't specify Lazarus, all of the graves would have opened up. And verse 44, the man who had died came out, his hands and feet still bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Why? Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Many of the Jews, in verse 45, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> and then shortly after Lazarus is raised from the dead, now we have the week of Passover. And the fame of Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus is growing. And people are believing in droves. And this is where we come upon Palm Sunday. The large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there. They came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the next day, the large crowd came to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and even the King of Israel. And thus begins what we commonly refer to as Holy Week. Now, the next few chapters of John are recorded conversations that Jesus had with his followers and his disciples. It was almost like he was cramming them for a final exam. Because even though he had walked with them, spent nearly three and a half years with them, they still didn't seem to get it. And disciples had a knack for asking some really, like, the, the wrong questions. In some ways, you can call them, like, duh, disciples. 
they had a knack for for uh, but Jesus had a great knack for answering the questions that they should have been asking. And it's why he would end his phrase with he would end many of his teachings with the phrase, "The one who has ears, let him hear." He seemed to understand that not everyone will understand what he was saying. And when we keep asking the wrong questions, we risk missing or misunderstanding the whole meaning of Jesus' life and teaching. The primary purpose, if you think of this, Jesus' life and teaching was not primarily about how to go to heaven when you die. That was not his main focus. His main focus was how to live a heavenly kind of life here on earth before we go to eternity with him. But the good news is that these disciples led to some very memorable and important answers. And that is definitely true of the next uh, I am statement. John 13 starts a lengthy section that records Jesus' conversation with the disciples in the upper room. After washing all the disciples' feet, and you know which one I'm referring to there. In uh, 13, 21, Jesus tells them, someone's going to betray me. And the disciples are like, they're stunned, they're shocked. Who is it going to be? And then Jesus reveals it's Judas by, of all things, breaking bread with him. And then Judas storms out. And then we have in verse 33, Jesus says, Look, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus said, Look, I'm only going to be with you for a little while longer. Where I'm going, you're not going to be able to follow. And you have to think how dramatic a statement this was. These men who had given up everything to follow him. Three, three and a half years, their whole identity was wrapped up in this man. And now Jesus says, you can't come with me. But here's what you can do, he says. Verse 34, new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Then comes the first of three wrong questions we're going to review. This one from Peter, of course. Peter, he's always the first one out there. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, I'm going, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. So you'll be able to get there later. Then Peter does what Peter often does. Puts his foot in his mouth and says, Jesus Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. And Jesus answered, will you? Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow to have denied me three times. And this sequence of events is the background that that leads to what happens next. You have to see this. The disciples are deeply troubled this is what led to Judas, uh, directly to Judas' betrayal. It's, it's, uh, or right after the, the, we know Judas is going to betray him, now we're following Jesus' announcement. He's going to go away, and they can't follow him. And now Peter, one of the leaders of the group, Peter's going to deny him. This is, they're in disarray. And then Jesus opens chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I mean, they, they're troubled. Wouldn't you? I mean, they're human. They're just like us. And I'm glad they're not perfect. Or else we wouldn't have had Jesus kind of breaking things down so we could understand it. We would have lost some of these great instructions that the Lord has for us. We needed them to be disciples so that we could get it too. But man, would they have been troubled. But then their master says this, don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus takes no pleasure in doubt and uneasiness of his people. Charles Spurgeon says this, he would not have us sad. Great personal sorrows may well be an excuse if the griefs of others are somewhat overlooked. Yet although Jesus was going to his last bitter agony and to death itself, he overflowed with, symp- with symp- sympathy for his followers. He's heading straight to the cross, and his concern is about them not being troubled. 
Then Thomas pipes up. He's the next one to ask a wrong question. Jesus tells him, look, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. Or would I have told you that I'd go prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am going, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Now, the word rooms is, uh, is uh, translated mane, which means to stay or to abide. It speaks of not a specific rooms per se, but a place to, say, to stay, uh, an abiding place, which we're going to get to a little bit later. So for now, it, it might not be so much that Jesus is talking about heaven, rather he's talking about a place of intimacy with the Father, with the Father's family. Jesus is going to come back to take them there with him. It's maybe not necessarily referring to the second coming, but talking about the resurrection, something far more imminent to them. And we can get this from statements he has later in the chapter. He says, I will not, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. Verse 23 says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. An abiding place with our father. And Jesus is referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit after the ascension. The, the Holy Spirit is the means by which a father and son can make their home with us. So Thomas says this, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So it kind of gets back a reflection on Peter's question. How can we know? If we don't know, how do we know the way? It's not a request for information. It's an expression of confusion. Like he doesn't even know what to ask at this point in time. And Jesus' response to all this chaos is assurance. Again, in verse 1, don't be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. And I think this statement is the essence of the whole gospel message. Instead of us having to explain, define, argue, or prove anything, God simply wants our trust. He's saying, believe in God. Believe in me. Trust God. Trust me. And then verse 14, or excuse me, chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. It's like Jesus saying, look, you don't need to understand everything. You just need to trust me. Don't, don't look for a way apart from me, he says. Don't look for another route or a destination. Don't look for some concept or technique or system that is separate from me. Just trust me. Everything you need is in me. I will bring you to my Father's abiding place. The way, the truth, the life, they're not separate from me. Jesus is saying, I am these things. You will find these things in me. He's like, whether or not you know what I've been talking about, know this, you know me, and you know the Father, and you know the way, you know the truth, and you know the life. Thomas Kempis a uh, German canon copier and a devotional author from the 1400s wrote this, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without life, there is no living. And then Philip gets involved. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. It's the core of the whole conversation. Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. That's why Jesus almost seems baffled that he would ask, show us the way to the Father. Jesus just said, I'm the way. Philip says, okay, show us the Father. And Jesus is like, look, I've been here the whole time. I am the Father and the Father's in me. And if Jesus and the Father are one. And if they are one, if I am in him and him in me, he says, then of course there's no other way to the Father. 
No one can come to the Father apart from Jesus because they are in, have an inseparable relationship. Our arrogance and our ignorance, oftentimes we want to prove to ourselves that we, that we need more, or we want more, or we, we won't be satisfied until we get more. More clarity, more technique, more intellectual knowledge, more than just this personal confidence in Christ. But Jesus doesn't always give us the information that we want. He gives us the information that we need. And he reassures, we don't have to understand everything so long as we trust him. If we trust him, if we abide in him, even though we may not have all the answers, we'll have the answer. John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now, when he says this, at this point in time, Jesus and the disciples, they've left the upper room. They're walking through Jerusalem toward the Garden of Gethsemane, we can guess. And at the time of his great, uh, at the time of Jesus, at the temple, there's this great golden vine that's hung over the entrance to uh, the Jerusalem temple. The Jewish historian uh, Josephus describes it as this, said the gate opening into the building was, as I said, completely overlaid with gold, as was the whole wall around it. It had, moreover, above in these golden vines from which depended grape clusters as tall as a man. It was a big, gaudy, glorious sight. And the second part of Jesus' farewell discourse is given en route, like to the Last Supper, then the venue, and to the venue of the garden where he's going to be betrayed. His teaching of the true vine may have been right in front of this temple with the great golden vine in the background. So he might look over there and he says, look, I am the true vine. And this is a reference from one of the most popular passages from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Scriptures in Isaiah 5. It's called the Song of the Vineyard. And I encourage you to go back and read this later after you get a little bit understanding here. It's a beautiful picture of what it means to abide in Jesus. Isaiah 5, 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but he yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more has there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. It, it will also command the clouds that they, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. Look for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So Israel's this picture uh, is portrayed, they're portrayed as the vineyard of God. So it's a very familiar picture that the people would, of that time would have known. And now Jesus is saying that the new Israel is the spiritual fulfillment of God's promise. He's saying, look, the one who's connected to the true vine is connected through Jesus rather than Abraham. So the big question is, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? And one of the great spiritual uh, difficulties, spiritual challenges that we have is we are very much time-conscious human beings trying to relate to a timeless God. We live under the tyranny of the clock, but God is outside of time, inhabiting all of eternity. Isaiah 40 tells us to wait 
for the Lord. He said, those, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How many of you are good at waiting? Most of you are having a hard time waiting for this message to be over. <laughs> We're bad at waiting. I'm terrible at waiting. Because it just takes so much time to wait. Most of us, we're not in danger of renouncing our faith. Most of us are in more danger of being distracted, rushed, preoccupied, that we'd rather settle for a watered-down, mediocre version of God than wait for the whole thing. John Orderberg wrote a book called The Life You've Always Wanted. And in it, he describes this disease of modern life called hurry sickness. We'll buy almost anything that promises to help us hurry. Think about it, shampoo and conditioner. Because it takes so long to rinse out the first time. Or Domino's Pizza. They don't sell pizza, they sell delivery in 30 minutes or less. And then we have McDonald's. No one buys McDonald's because it's good. No one buys it even because it's cheap. You get it because it's fast. And then there became this problem where you'd have to park your car and get out and talk to someone and then sit down and eat your food. So they did away with all that and they created the drive through And now you don't even have to leave your house. You just text someone, bring my food to me, and they'll bring it right to you. Meyer Friedman describes hurry sickness as a continuous struggle to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time, frequently in the face of opposition, real or imagined from another person. And we have symptoms of this, of this disease. One is we're constantly speeding up our daily activities, reading, talking, eating. Uh, we're driving, we're calculating which car is going to pull away from the light faster. When you get in line at the grocery store, you're trying to figure out which line is going to move faster, and you're still keeping track of your spot in that other line, just in case that one moved faster. You want to know that you won, that you beat them. And if they beat you, you feel depressed for the rest of the day. You pick the wrong line. Multitasking. It used to be called doing more than one thing at the same time, but that takes too long to say. Most people do it best in their car. They, they, can, they can drive, eat, shave, put on makeup, drink coffee, listen to the radio, talk on the phone, and make hand gestures all at the same time while driving. The third uh, sign is superficiality. Depth can only come slowly in relationships, in conversations, and thoughts, but too often we trade wisdom f just for information. We trade depth for breath, how many people will consume 60-second Instagram sermons on church stuff but not walk through the doors? And another problem with this hurry is an inability to truly love. Love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love takes time. Time is the one thing hurried people don't have. And this is why hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life. It's impossible to be aware of the Father's love if we're always in a hurry. So what's the cure? Abide in Jesus. Luke 10 tells us a story about Mary and Martha. They're preparing a meal. That, remember, the sisters of Lazarus is previously mentioned. As they going along the way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha came and welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but the one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. Jesus commends the attitude of Mary in the story as opposed to Martha. 
Martha, whose last name may have been Stuart, I don't know, but she's in the kitchen making a centerpiece. She's, she's preparing the table. She's carving out their name, name tags. She's getting the fine china out and setting it all up there. And the whole time she's working, she's slaving away. There's Mary just sitting there doing nothing. And doesn't Mary just frustrate you? We got Mary's and Martha's in this room. If we were to do this whole thing about going to, if I was in the youth group, I'd say, all right, if you're more like Martha, go to this side. If you're more like Mary, go to this side. The Marthas would get up and move because that's what you do. The Marys would just sit there. <laughs> but this is what Jesus is talking about in, in chapter 15 when he says, abide in me. And he uses this imagery of a grapevine and branches growing out. He's the vine. We are the branches. And abiding in him creates fruitfulness, productivity. Verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. Think about it. Martha is busy. She's hurried. She's in a frenzy of activity. And that's the, that's the posture that most of us have. We're just go, go, going. And that's, that's what the, our culture rewards, getting things done. But Mary's sitting at the feet, of, sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is a true posture of a disciple. So how do we do this? How do we abide in Jesus? How do we sit at his feet? I'm going to share four regular practices you need to have in your life. This is not rev revolutionary information, but it's a reminder that we all need every now and then. The first thing, the first cure, or the first thing to do is scripture. Read the scripture. Read it every day. Before you start to read, ask the Lord to help you understand it. And one of the reasons that God sent the Holy Spirit to us is to help show us the truth. John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he, he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Then after you read, ask the Lord to show you how to live it out. How do, how do I put into action what I just read? Take your time reading. You may even want to go back and reread it slowly. I encourage people often, read it like you're taking a test. Study that thing. Absorb it. The second thing we need to do is worship, or maybe more specifically, corporate worship. Because I believe everything we, every breath we take is an act of worship. We need to develop a regular habit of getting together in corporate worship with God's people. And we need to come prepared to encounter the living God. Not, we're not coming to evaluate, critique, and compare. We're coming to sit at the feet of Jesus with our brothers and sisters. Think about this. Do you remember, some of you might, maybe you remember your children. Remember how excited your kids were to go to kindergarten? And they would just go in and they would sit down around and the teacher would teach them colors and numbers. And when they would go home afterwards, they would tell you what? Numbers and colors. And they were so excited to learn how to count to 10. This is exciting things they learned in school. That should be church. How excited it is to go and be a part of that. Look at what I learned today when I sat at the feet of Jesus. Wonderful. Prepare for worship. Do you prepare to come into this building? Do you pray? Do you set aside time? Do you make this a priority in your life? The third thing is fellowship. It is so important to gather together with other believers. I think all of us would say life is tough. But it's even tougher on your own. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Think about this. If we're supposed to be examples of Christ, then when you get together with people who are exhibiting Christ-like behavior, it's just another opportunity to encounter Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And when we gather together, it's just a sweet aroma of his presence. Romans, 10, Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Imagine you're having a tough week, and you get together in your small group here at church, and everyone's trying to outdo each other in love and honor. That's what the body of Christ is to be. And then I say the best for last. It should always be our first. Prayer. We should pray at fixed times. 
We should pray at random times. First Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Far too often we look at prayer as a last resort rather than a right and a privilege to be able to go to the Father, to the creator of the whole entire universe. This is a good thing. And I know at times it may feel difficult and out of place, but God wants to connect with us. Go to him. So as we wrap up the end of this journey, I think the best thing to say or the best point, the best encouragement I can give to you is to abide in Christ. We learn for all he is and how he wants to live with us and he invites us, encourages us to abide with him forever and ever, the great I am. Poet Lyle C. Rawlings wrote this poem in 2008. The greatest man in history, Jesus, had no servants, yet they called him master. Had no degree, yet they called him teacher. Had no medicines, yet they called him healer. Had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him king. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. He is bread, he is light, he's the door, he's the good shepherd, he's the resurrection, he's the way, he's the vine, he is life. King of kings, Lord of lords, Alpha, Omega, Prince of Peace, Messiah, Waymaker, Emmanuel, God with us forever. And as a father has loved me, he says, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Father God, we, we want to abide in you. We want to be fruitful, be connected to the vine, but man, too often we are not that good at it. We're distracted, we're hurried, we're running after so many useless things. Help us today, help us this season to slow down. Sit at your feet and abide in you. And what a great opportunity we get throughout the world to celebrate what you did for us on the cross, but perhaps even greater, what you did in the grave. Knowing you are alive and waiting to reunite with us. May we take advantage of this season to tell people who you are to us, to abide in you. It's your great holy name we pray. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.